What's up, my friends? Welcome back to another podcast. My name is Mike Perrine. This is the Everyday Detox Podcast, and I'm here at the studio tonight, Vitality, New York City, and uh, it's a little bit on the late side. Just wrapped up a podcast with Dr. Fred Bishy, who was here tonight and very generously uh, agreed to sit down and do a podcast. We haven't done one since 2015. November 2015 is when I think the last podcast came out with Dr. Bishy and I. Uh, I set this up. If you're watching this on YouTube, I had to set this up very quickly to be kind to time. So uh, I used cameras we hadn't used before. I used some GoPros. We're trying that out. It's the first time. Didn't have time to set up the shots. Didn't have time to do proper lighting, but uh, I think it came out okay. So if it looks different than the other podcasts, that's what it's about. And uh, Dr. Bishi and I sat down. We caught up on some things. We discussed uh, fruit. He told us some of his favorite foods. Uh, we talked about fasting and dry fasting, and he told this story of when he was exposed to black mold and had black mold poisoning and ended up in the hospital and some of the things that happened to him there. Uh, and then at the end, one of the cameras shut off and uh, we had to end very abruptly. So uh, anyway, it was really great. It was great catching up with him, and I think you guys are really going to like this. So let's jump right in. I like this. I want us to just catch up like we would if we were sitting on the couch over there. Okay. Because what tends to happen with these podcasts is everything's always cool. Everyone's talking, having the best conversations. And then once we sit here and I shut all the vents off and it gets quiet and the cameras go on, like it gets really awkward. So I just want us to catch up like it's been a while. Because in a sense, we are catching up. I haven't seen you for a while. Yeah, absolutely. So for everyone listening or watching, so this is the, how this came together. Dr. Bishy's here uh, tonight. It's Saturday night. And uh, he agreed to stay late with me and do a podcast. I threw everything together the best I could. We're using new cameras if you're watching this on YouTube. But I don't have Nick here to help me do that. Uh, Nick's in Hawaii having like the time of his God life. God bless him. Good oh, luck. He's eating jackfruit. He's eating. Oh, my God. Jackfruit. Oh, oh, I love jackfruit. It's one of my favorite foods. It's amazing how jackfruit is now like a staple like i used to have to find it maybe once a year once every two years at some obscure stall in chinatown or you have to drive to brooklyn chinatown to get it but now it's everywhere whole foods supermarkets right. i had some in maine the other day it's like i just had one 35 pound jackfruit where did you get that um my son-in-law got it for me in new jersey yeah he brought it to me um, just unbelievable. I'm really happy. I thought no one's ever going to be into jackfruit in the United States because it's... Oh, such, I love jackfruit. But not the flavor, but you know, it's big. You got the latex. You got to cut it. I thought, who's going to be into that? Everybody's into it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you got to wear latex gloves. You got to slice and break up, break it open because it's about sticky. Yeah. But it's, it's just delicious. I had a... Um, when I was in... The first time I went to Hawaii, speaking of Hawaii, where Nick is now, uh, first time I went to Hawaii was the first time I had jackfruit. And it did something to me. It was like, um, I don't want to sound corny by saying this, but it was like a spiritual experience in the sense that it was the first time I had ever really like stood on the earth in the rain because I was in one of the rainforest areas uh, in this place called Puna on the Big Island. And like it was raining and you could just smell the rain and the negative ions in the earth. And I'm standing there holding this jackfruit and I'm tasting it. And it's just this explosion of flavors in my mouth. And it was just I call it a spiritual experience because it was just a very uh, I felt like I was living on purpose because that's a natural food that appears in nature for a human to eat. And coming from Staten Island, growing up on pizza, you know, standing in a rainforest, oh, yeah. eating a jackfruit and experiencing that exact flavor sensation that nature intended for a human being was just, it was kind of magical. I just, it just, it, some feeling came over me, so. Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad you said that because uh, every time I eat jackfruit, something happens and I can't put my finger on what it is, but it kind of gives you this subtle sense of well-being mm -hmm. that you don't seem to get from anything else. I, I say it's probably my favorite fruit. I do like fruit. I do eat a lot of fruit and I love fruit, but that's, that's probably my favorite. That's my favorite fruit too. All yeah. the way up at the top. I'd tell people about it for years. Nobody knew what it was. Now everybody knows. So what are, you, what are your top five favorite foods? I would say jack, jackfruit, blueberries, strawberries, um, dragon fruit. I like a lot of the exotic fruit. You know what I'm saying? I, I don't want to give people the wrong idea that, I'm, uh, that, I'm, that I say I'm, I live on fruit. But I do, I do eat a lot of fruit based on the amount of exercise that I do. And I usually do exercise a lot. And, uh, but... Uh, I also, um, I mean, I like um, I like leafy greens. I like to make smoothies. I like to throw smoothies, throw a lot of greens into a smoothie and throw some 
berries in it and things like that. And you eat fats. Huh? You eat raw plant oh, I, fats. I eat fats. Of course I do. So what do you think? Have you, so, okay, so it's, we've come a long way from when we used to sit in your office and have discussions about all this stuff. And, uh, you know, there would, there would be 20 people at a meeting that we might lead an event for. You know, I met you in uh, 1995. So what's that, 20, 23 years ago? Um, at so at we've least. come a long way. I mean, look at this place. This yeah. place can exist. This is my biggest studio yet. You look at what's going on with Juice Press, which is like the new Starbucks. I just, Brittany just showed me that they're in Boston now. And, oh, they're all uh, over the place. Yeah, Whole Foods everywhere. The internet's here. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of nutritional debate. There's a lot of noise. And it's really interesting uh, when you think about how, and you think about, <laughs> I think about this with politics and religion, how people really like to go tribal. So there are these ideas where people, they're either all in on fat or they're all in on low fat, high carb, but there's, it's, it's a very specific dietary path they choose. And I never understand, people ask me, like clients will come in and they're like, well, which one do you eat? And I'm like, why do I have to choose? I eat like fresh fruits and carbs all day and then I'll eat some salad with avocado and olives at night. Like why do, you know, I don't understand why there's a, um, why there's this division that happens in these dietary philosophies. Uh, you, have you talked to people about these things? Yeah, I, I, I speak about that all the time. Just to bring a little of uh, maybe some more clarity into the situation, I just came back from Cornell University where I met with uh, T. Colin Campbell. Oh, was this for the film that you guys are yes, filming? Yes, right, we're doing a documentary. We have a lot of, you know, um, you know, real scientists uh, going to be in on it, and I have to lead athletes that follow different types of diets. But my uh, my philosophy and the science behind what I tell people to do hasn't really changed much in the last fifty five years, because um, there's there's a number of different ways to look at this. In other words, if you're taking if you're taking a fat and you're cooking it, you're actually altering the molecule structure and have a different impact on your body. So if somebody has coronary artery disease, like many, many years ago, Nathan Pritikin devised a, a diet, a plant-based diet for people with coronary artery disease that definitely worked. And he took every, told everybody he couldn't eat no avocados, no nuts, no fats, no oils, and things like that. And there's no two ways about it that does help a person autolyze the, uh, the plaque in their arteries. But does a person have to do that? In my estimation, no. The reason why I say no, I've seen plenty of people eat, you know, eat a moderate amount, you know, they eat a moderate amount of avocados and they eat a moderate amount of nuts. And if they want to, they don't have to, they can use a little bit of olive oil on their salad. And I've seen their arteries clear out too. But not with no frying, no stuff frying, nothing like that. So that's the big differentiator, right? Like, so when you were talking about cooked food versus raw food, heating fats and proteins is really where, yeah. which well, is really where the damage occurs. Well, once you start heating oils, it causes glycation. It's a, it's a carcinogen. It causes inflammation in your arteries. Your arteries will clog up. There's no two ways about it. At this point, listen, I just to um, give a, a bit of analogy why I come to these conclusions, I've tried everything for years. I took certain aspects of this and did it for years to see what would happen. You know that. I've always shared with you. And uh, I've come to the conclusion that uh, I have a guy coming to me right now, had a couple heart attacks, and his arteries were clogged and everything like that. So I told him temporarily to, to leave out the oils, don't eat the nuts and the avocados, and he's eating some starches. It's not all raw. He's eating some starches, and it's clearing out right away. So as soon as that's cleared out, I'm going to tell him he's able to eat some oils and some things like that, and then he could upgrade his diet in another respect. I would tell him to eat less starches and you know, try to eat 80% raw. The whole key is to, there's so much confusion and so many com complications and so many ways of eating out there now. You know, there's the raw food diet, there's a vegetarian diet, uh, there's a vegan diet where you're eating cooked food, there's a ketogenic diet, which is the rage now, and people are throwing in intermittent fasting, which is all over the place now. So, but what we all, and years ago was the Atkins diet, and what happens, a lot of people ate the Atkins diet, and they got results, and kind of had people scratching their heads because people lost weight, their blood sugar come down, their cholesterol come down, they were eating all this meat. But there's, once you understand the underlying paradigm of what's happening, when you eat those type of diets, 
your burning body fat. That's the whole key behind it. You mean high protein, high fat, low carb, Well, I don't fiber. recommend the high protein diet under any circumstances. But I, I mean, mean, you said when you eat those type of diets, you mean those Well, you do get diet, some right? kind of an immediate effect. On the short term, it looks like it's really good because you lose weight, like the, uh, the, the, the high protein diet. You lose weight, you have no cravings, you're at the top, your uh, appetite is satisfied, and your blood sugar comes down, but that's only temporary. Because what happens, you reach a point where your body chemistry changes and you don't lose weight on that type of a diet. Plus, you also reach a point where you start to have cravings because it's natural for our body to, to want to eat fruits and vegetables. We're designed that way. If you, look at it, if you look at the whole animal kingdom, every species of animal has a species-specific diet. You know, if you can look at the human body, we are not designed to eat animal protein. We just don't have the, the teeth, we don't have the claws, we don't have the, the intestinal tract. But the human body over millions of years has adjusted to be able to survive on some animal protein. But people always go to bodybuilders and weightlifters. Now, a lot of, I lifted weights when I was young. I was over 200 pounds when I was a kid. I, I ate animal protein. And, but if you're looking at that as a criteria for health, which is a mistake, you can make a terrible mistake because you eat a lot of animal protein and you eat, uh, you know, you eat a little bit of greens and everything like that. And you eat some carbohydrates. You'll get, you know, 18, 20 inch arms, bench press 450 pounds, but you're going to run into trouble. Yeah, you'll stimulate but growth, but you'll wreck your heart, you'll wreck your Plus you're getting all yeah. the nitrogenous byproducts, which are poisons. You know what I mean? So you're going to run into trouble. Everybody knows an exception to the rule. Everybody knows somebody that's done drugs, you know, cheated, did everything, and they live to be 80, 85 years old. But it's not a rule of thumb you want to go by. Today, the way things are taking place in this country, we all, people throw in the fact that we are living longer because of medical heroics, but we're getting sicker and sicker. This country is getting to be a real sick country. Cancer is out of control. And as I discussed up there with uh, T. Colin Campbell, who, um, you know, he's the author of the China Project, him and another two other doctors, one guy from China, one guy from England, I believe. And uh, they did an epidemiological study that shows that, you know, uh, eating, when people switch from a, a diet that's a plant-based diet, would eat more animal protein in, in uh, China, it shows up that they develop the same diseases. Now, his latest study is showing that Beyond the shadow of a doubt, I saw all the evidence, beyond the shadow of a doubt, scientifically, that if you, animal protein, whether it's dairy products or whether it's flesh food, no matter what it is, whether it's eggs, whether it's organic, they are a factor, on a, one of the main factors in people developing cancer. I have no doubt about that. I believed that all along, many, many years ago. I've seen plenty of people that you could actually see them developing, getting into a situation where they, where they uh, could get cancer. A lot of them did. Not all of them did. You know, there's so many variables taking place in the human body. There's, we have, a, you know, 100 trillion cells. We have all this bacteria living in us, 10 times more bacteria, which is the microbiome, you know, the bacteria, the good and bad guys in the stomach. I know it all very well. As yeah, I nerd okay, out you on know that, that all as day. Well as yeah. anybody. I know. So the key is there is so much confusion uh, today now because of the exponential knowledge that's on the internet. People just, you know, everybody's getting into now the ketogenic diet. And does the ketogenic diet work? Yes, it does work. But it's a backup system for the human body. Well, it works to take weight off and to take uh, blood sugar down, but does it work long term? I mean, no. it's got to wreck the no, colon. No, it doesn't because you're, yeah. long term, you're going to, first of all, a lot of people doing a ketogenic diet, they make it the Atkins diet. They're just eating a lot of animal protein. Uh, Dr. Jason Fong, who's a, a brilliant doctor who recommends that type of diet, you see their blood sugar drop, a lot of things change. He doesn't recommend that you eat a lot of animal protein. You can eat some. It's a high fat diet. Animal protein and animal fat is a poor source of fuel. You're forcing your body to burn body fat. When you're burning body fat, you produce ketones. Just like I discussed with uh, Dr. Campbell, a lot of doctors saying that your, your brain is designed to, bu to burn glucose as fuel. A lot of scientists say now you could burn ketones. I haven't found that to be true. I see no scientific evidence that is true. Your body will always go to blood sugar first. It'll always go there. 
And if it can't go there, you go into a diabetic coma in spite of ketones. That's why a lot of people end up on the floor when they have type 1 diabetes and urinating up a storm and their brain isn't getting any sugar. Okay, so they're burning body fat. Why aren't they producing the ketones to, re to replenish the, uh, the sugar going to your brain? So, and then another thing is your blood sugar is always between 70 and 99, according to most laboratories. It should be between 70 and 120. They lowered it. They had a, they had a vested inter interest in lowering it. But no matter if your blood sugar is uh, 72, it's in a low normal range, and you're on a ketogenic diet, you're not burning. Your body is always going to go to the blood sugar. It'll go to the blood sugar even if it's below 70. So I... I know there's a lot of people who would disagree with me, but I haven't seen any scientific evidence. I haven't seen no, no studies with people that come to me that I watch. I've probably seen, um, maybe seen 25,000 people in over 50 years. So it's kind of like I watch what, who gets better, who don't get better, who does better. And of course, there's an emotional, psychological, spiritual factors in there. Everybody knows that, what I believe about that. And what that means, when I say there's emotional, psychological, spiritual, spiritual factors in here, it's that <clears throat> it's based on epigenetics. You know, the, the, what you believe spiritually, the thoughts you have that you entertain will become a reality because it does tri trigger your genetic expression. In other words, if you have a lot of anxiety and you have a lot of fear, statistics show that if you're an anxiety neurotic, if you're eating a great diet, you have a 35% better chance of getting cancer because what's happened epigenetically, outside the, in the membrane of the cell, there's switches and markers that let information into, that will make the DNA, you know, produce certain types of cells. So the human body is, to me, it knows exactly what to do. It, knows, it has more information that's programmed into it to such an extent that scientists are just starting to find out some of it. Listen, how come that 45, 50 years ago, when people were talking about fasting or intermittent fasting, you know, what they meant in those days was skipping breakfast. Now they label it intermittent Isn't fasting. Isn't it funny? I know I was talking to Gil about this the other day, and we were laughing because we're laughing. like, what is intermittent fasting? Yeah. They're like, that's every day? It's that's what we do? Label. Yeah, it's, it's another skipping label. That's all. But here, this is the interesting part about intermittent fasting being a thing. I hear people talk about it on podcasts. Everybody's and, doing it. And, but, but the fact that it actually is a thing shows how much food people eat all the time. That if they, they have to celebrate and name and classify and define the fact that they haven't eaten for 14 hours or 15 hours. You know, it's like how, there's I mean, I've seen this with clients over the years where people are eating at 10, 11 o'clock at night, they fall asleep at 6 a.m. and they're doing protein shakes and already eating food again at that time. I mean, people are constantly putting something into their body. So that's so, I mean, it's good that everybody's intermittent fasting. It's just funny it has an, it's, oh, yeah, a, it's no, a thing, it has a name all, now. All you're really doing is extending the overnight fast to clean up the mess you created the day before. Yeah. And that's why the real fallacy, the real, what's really ludicrous to me is that when the people are being told to eat five to seven meals a day, it's the opposite. Now, that'll pump you all up, and they think that's going to, they, what they feel in the morning when the body's trying to detox, they think that's the blood sugar. Your blood sugar's going down. So what do you do? You eat some bacon and eggs or make a protein shake, and you feel better, so they think you, they stopped your blood sugar from going down. That's, that's ludicrous also. Yeah, they stop, have, they stop the detox is what yeah, happened. Yeah, they stop the detox. Yeah, that's the hair of the dog thing. People used right. to say, if I'd be really hungover, someone would say, oh, you should have a beer. That'll, that'll do it. Have a beer in the morning. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, that actually always made me sick. Well, but I understand the same analogy the if you're a drug addict and you're going through withdrawal, take the drug. Yeah, it's a, it's a hard switch for people to make when they're, because, you know, they don't classify their, their you know, um, tricks or their uh, lucky charms as a drug. You know, because they grew up eating it, their parents ate something like it, so they just think it's food. So nobody realizes that they're actually stopping a detox process. They just think they're eating. You but know, Mike, the sad thing about it is that it really is so simple. It's so logical. It just, we really are what we eat. We really don't need a lot of food. Everybody is overeating. Just about everybody is overeating. I remember reading a book by Luigi Canero many years ago. I don't know if you ever heard of Luigi Canero. 
No. He was an I Italian nobleman that, that was, he was in his 40s, and uh, it's, a, it's a classical book. He, he had liver disease. He was a glutton. He indulged and drank, did everything wrong, and the doctor told him, the doctors of that day told him he wasn't going to live very long. So he read a book by a Russian guy that said if you eat very little, your body will heal itself. That's like what I tell people. What you leave out is critically important. So he decided to eat 14 ounces of food a day. I think he ate an egg yolk, some whole wheat crust or something. It wasn't even the greatest food. It was like health food for that time. I guess so. Yeah. You know. So he did that. And within a year and a half, he recovered from everything. He was, right, he was going hunting on a horse. and he was, he was doing fabulous. So that's all he ever did. Then he was in his 90s. And his... Uh, um, great grandson, which a little, he says, Grandpa, uh, you're very skinny. He was very skinny. I don't think the guy weighed 100 pounds, according to the book. Now, I don't know how tall he was. Grandpa, you're very skinny. I've had people tell me that. Oh, Grandpa, you're very skinny. I, I know. So they said, uh, try eating a little bit more. So he wanted to make the kid happy. So he upped it to 18 ounces. He added a couple other things in. I don't remember what he added in, but he started to feel sick. He didn't feel good because the body chemistry had changed. The body had shrunk on a cellular level. It took less intercellular pressure to cause inflammation. Let's explain that to everybody. Uh, this is a big concept. So this is about, uh, and this was, um, this happens, we see this a lot with people that are juice fasting for long periods of time. Anytime you clean up the chemistry, uh, release a certain amount of toxicity and communicate to your body that it's going to be really efficient. That's the thing that people don't understand that flip flop all over. I call it stock graft dieting is that your body responds to what you do consistently and it believes you very so, quickly. Yeah. And it believes that that's the way that it's going to exist. It just believes whatever you tell it, that's going to happen consistently. So, uh, one of the, the things that I bring up a lot of the time when, um, when people, when I'm talking to people that were eating clean for a while and moving backward, I talk about that time that, uh, Juice feasting was huge. I think it was like 2006 or seven, and yeah. everyone was doing juice feast, and they were drinking about a gallon of juice a day. Uh, people were losing tremendous amounts of weight. They were doing it up to 90 days sometimes. I know. I and know. Uh, what happened was people started eating the food that initially, because these were all people that were juice feasting were generally into health food and raw food already. So they had already achieved a very high level of health. They lost a lot of weight. They all felt good. Then they got into juice feasting. They next leveled it. They had tremendous experiences. And they went back to eating their avocado wraps and their, you know, like their regular raw food. But they started to gain weight and feel gross. Yeah. And that's because they didn't do it slow enough. And they, they told their body it was going to live one way. And then they tried to take a step backward. And right. the body started to process all that as waste. Right. It was just a burden on the chemistry, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Excess of anything is not... It's, Excess of anything is going to cause a reaction someplace down the road. Mm. Your body is that. Your body is. You, you can't really negotiate with your chemistry. Everything is action and reaction. Whatever you do, there are so, certain psychosomatic influence. Your mind, can, like we said, with epigenetic expression. But whatever you do, your body's going to react to. That's the key. And just because. You know, you drink out of two bottles, and one says soda, and the other one says poison, and you mix the bottles up, and you say, I'm not going to let this bother me. I'm not going to make a choice. Whatever you drink out, of, that's the result you're going to get. It's the same thing with no matter how much we delude ourselves in what we're doing. Oh, I'm hungry. It's late. Uh, this is a special occasion. It's uh, my grandma's birthday. I'm going to do this. And I've seen that with people into raw foods. When they start moving around, I mean, I've seen people get cancer because they, somebody said, oh, they, somebody would convince them, oh, you can make, uh, you can put eggs in your smoothies, you can do this and you can do that. I mean, not a good idea if you've been on a 100% raw food diet, you know, for 10 years or so. I don't, I start to shake when I see people do that. I really do because why? Because first of all, I know what the possibilities are. I don't want to sound you know, arrogant or anything like that, but it's just from trial and error over the years and watching people. And uh, I don't like what the outcome could be. And of course, I mean, overeating on anything is not the answer. I know plenty of people, they, you know, they eat humongous amounts of food. They think because it's a vegan or a, a raw food diet, they think it's okay. Or they're getting up, they, and they say, well, you, 
I've heard people years ago say you can't overeat on a raw diet. Oh, yeah, really? That's not true. Yeah, it depends on what you're eating. Depends so, upon what you're eating. Nobody overeats on spinach. Everybody yeah, overeats on I jars know. of cashew butter. <laughs> so, and then I seen people that were eating late at night, not getting enough sleep. I seen some of those people get cancer. I could almost predict it. The human body is a very sophisticated biological organism. It's got a very specific design. It's extremely sensitive. Everything is connected. It's an ecosystem. Everything is connected. Your finger is not separated from your toe. Everything is related. Where you get a symptom, that all that means is it's where, for some reason or other, that's where the, 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 your chemistry is going to express the symptom. It doesn't mean that it's, you know, it's just your finger that's a problem. If you, I remember once, many, many years ago, when I was experimenting with fasting, I did a lot of long-term fasting, and uh, <clears throat> before that, I had took a, a t piece of the tip of my finger off. They really took the tip of my pinky off. I dropped, we were carrying a, a huge beam, and the guy on the other end of the beam dropped it, and I held on to it, and then it slipped out of my hand, mm -hmm. and it actually come down on my finger, and it took the tip of my finger off. Did well, it get you in the nail, or just like? No, it took part of the nail off, you know, that's that yeah, yeah. thing. So what happened is that then many years later, when I, you know, I thought I was all true detox, one day I started to get like a throbbing effect in my finger. Then I got like a big bulb, like a, you know, it looked like a little marble. I looked at it, it was white. So I took a razor, and I just cut it this way. Everything come out of it. That stuff was coming out of me for years. This is an ongoing process that your body has to keep up with. with Wait, so just explain to everybody what happened with your finger. It was, it was, an, it was your body was using as an area of exit to I release toxicity. Regret, right. Well, you know, it's really interesting. Uh, there's a, somebody, um, a popular YouTuber and Snapchatter. Uh, her name is Dr. Pimple Popper. And she um, video, uh, she, she creates videos of all of uh, the things that she does at work, from like removing blackheads, from popping these massive pimples, removing cysts, uh, lipomas, and all these things. And uh, she always talks about it, and I sent her a few inquiries. I wanted to know what she thought about it. She had this thing on Snapchat where she said, if anyone has any questions, ask me a question. And I said, do you see any relationship to what people are eating or levels of toxicity or job descriptions and what kind of stuff comes through their skin? And she never answered me. But she always maintains, and I think it, it's, common, uh, it, it's commonly held in the world of dermatology, that when there are skin eruptions, that it's just trapped dead skin cells that are coming out. Yet, doing the work that I do, we always see people with bad skin have their skin clear up once we start to address the bowel. So I'm always curious, like, why, why hasn't anybody put that together yet? And I'm wondering, is it because nobody does an actual um, pathology report on the contents that are coming out of people's pores and coming out no, of their... No, they don't do that. Yeah. I mean, if they really took a serious look at it, if you were able to sit down and talk to them, and, or, you know, if they had... Uh, I mean, they all study organic chemistry. They should be able to get that. Um, your bowels... I mean, your bowels are critically criti criti important. The lower and the upper GI tract, the... Uh, extremely, extremely important. A lot of the upper GI tract, well, that's where we absorb a lot of our nutrients, and that's where most of the people, when they're talking about having gas, they, they pat their belly button, you know, and they, that's where they have bloat and everything. That's the, what's in the lower bowels is backed up into the upper bowels, and mm -hmm. that's, that's where it's coming from. It's coming from the upper GI tract. If that gets high enough, if, if that discomfort, they have that much gas in the small intestines, the villi that absorb the nutrients, that gas will go. This, a lot of people are going to think I'm crazy, but I don't care. They're, I'm going to say it because it's true, because I use that a lot in what I do. The gas will go from a low pressure. It will go from a high pressure. It will go to a low to a, any place where the gas will go. So if you look at the Guyton's book on physiology, so that's what we're talking about. Diffuse up through the villi into the bloodstream and create right. a back pressure onto the cell structure. So when you go into a good diet, that's why I say when the body contracts, right? So you go into a good diet, you keep your bowels clean, you're leaving out all the processed food, you're not eating late at night, you're not overeating, you're chewing your food. Then what happens? You don't have, and everything's moving through you quickly. And that's why a lot of people get the diverticulosis. 
and have all ulcerated colitis and all that type of stuff. Is it from in, it's from inflammation. So what happens if it moves through you quickly and you don't have pressure in there, then the, the uh, carbonic acid in the cells, it will start to go the other way because the human cell is like us. It takes in nourishment and it gives off waste, the gas. So if you give it a chance, it's not always under pressure, then it's going to start to release more gas. It's going to respirate more effectively. Yeah. yeah, and that's where the inflammation comes from. If you keep packing that stuff in there, or if you're on that type of a, a diet where your body is contracted, and you know, then all of a sudden you say, gee, I've been on a vegan diet, a raw food diet, whatever diet you're on, and your body is clean, then you say you go back, you let go, and you do everything wrong, that body will not, those cells will not be able to take that gas expansion the way it did if you did over a period of lifetime. It comes down quicker, but it doesn't, you know, without having inflammation, that cell will not be able to cope. It will, but it's going to cause inflammation. It's going to cause problems. Right. So basically, the cells are um, decreasing their surface area as pressure right. comes off. Exactly. They're adapting to that. The cell structure tightens. And then if someone starts to eat a diet again that produces mega it amounts of it gas. It can't adapt fast enough. Right. It puts a lot of pressure on that Unless cell. Unless you take, two, yeah. take a couple of years or months. I, you know, there are people that do that. Right. Law of accommodation. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Like when I used, you know, it's, uh, I always use this example when I talk about that. Like, when I used to smoke cigarettes as a kid, when I first started, I really wanted to look cool. I wanted to smoke. Yeah. And I remember I'd go hang out with people, I'd smoke a cigarette, and I'd get these massive headaches. And then the headaches stopped. And I was so happy. I was yeah. like, I was like 13. <laughs> so I was so happy because I thought, oh, now I could smoke and I don't have to get this raging headache. And I'd be, you know, but what it was happening is my body was slowly adapting and accommodating the toxicity of that, which is not a good thing. No, not no. Either. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about fasting a little bit. I know you've done a lot of fasting. Um, juice fasting is very popular. You've done some uh, some very long water fasts. You have a lot of experience with that. One of the things that's come up that I've seen a lot on the internet uh, is dry fasting. Right. Yeah. And I, you know, when I first learned about fasting, no one ever talked about that. I didn't even, in my mind, I didn't think that dry fasting would even be therapeutic because of the absence of water being, you know, a solvent and transport it can be. medium. It's risky, but it can be therapeutic. Dr. Sergei Falanov, a Russian guy, which I've had conversations with him, even though we didn't understand each other. He actually lives in Siberia. He's a big proponent of dry fasting. I actually did a seven-day dry fast that was, was actually done in a hospital. I think you know, you heard about what yeah, happened. Yeah, so let's tell it everyone what happened. Yeah, well, they didn't realize what was happening. So, but um, it's not something I would encourage anybody to do unless you really know what you're doing. If you did a 24 hour, I mean, people have to decide for themselves. I'm not recommending anything to be perfectly honest with you. I've experimented with so many different things to find out where truth was, where distortion of the truth was, where hype was. So seven days without fluid or food you did. Right. So what happened in the hospital? They, uh, um, you were in the hospital and they, were, they wanted to test something with your, uh, the way you were swallowing? Right, yeah. They thought that um, I had rest, uh, aspirational pneumonia because I had been exposed to mold. Right. I wasn't sick in 40 years. It actually ate a hole right through my skull. You know about that. That's another fact. We should tell everyone about that. That's another fascinating thing. Yeah, that's fascinating. So it thing. led to that. So you had some mold, uh, you had mold spores living in your sinuses and it ate a hole through the front of your sinus and well my whole my whole my whole face was distorted you know my eyes all my sinus we have six sinus cavities and uh luckily for me if i had gone the other way i would have died went into my where my brain was i would have died very, very quickly so it went out it let, me, let me give everyone a little context on this so um what year was it i don't remember but it was after we had met so it was what ni probably 94 no it was it wasn't oh, no i gave you a book Right. Huh? I gave you a book, and I remember you said, I don't have that book to give back to you because it's been destroyed. You had a sewage backup in, in your yeah, office, that's what in your basement. Oh, that's when it originally started. Right, so when there's I, water damage in your, in your office. Well, you yeah, had a raw sewage backup into my house. We had two feet of water with raw sewage in it. Up until that point, I was never sick. I, never, I didn't even have a cold. So that was part of the problem, i got to tell you the truth. And uh, I was still ex exercising like a maniac and everything. And so what happened, the raw sewage backed up, and I had a guy um, come in and clean it all up. Unfortunately, I didn't 
realize what it really meant. Uh, they just vacuumed up all the water. They didn't pick up all the rugs and everything. And they dried everything out. And that was on the ground floor where my office was. Thank God it wasn't upstairs because I'm very grateful it didn't affect my family. Yeah, that's where your family and your animals and everybody was yeah. upstairs. Yeah. So I was, in, I was in that office six days a week. Yeah. So after, I mean, I didn't feel well. I didn't feel well right away, you know what I mean? But I'm not the type of guy that dwells on my feelings, so I just slept it off. I figured my lifestyle could probably cope with just about anything. That was a mistake. So what happened is then after about, I don't remember the exact time factor, but after about three years, I started to cough. Mm -hmm. And I mean cough. So I was coughing violently. And I waited, I waited. I went on a fast, and uh, I didn't do a long fast. Then I, I didn't realize at that time the spores, it's not the mold, it's the spores, were in my sinus cavity. They were in my lungs. And they were actually in my, my heart because my heart was all over the place. So I'm not the type of guy to panic too easily. And I didn't, definitely didn't want to go to a doctor, but my family pressured me, and I figured I'd go to the doctor just to keep them quiet and see what happened. So the doctor says, one guy says, I had athletically, athletically induced asthma, and you know, they just said, and my head wasn't, I didn't have, look like a unicorn at that time. I remember when it started, it looked like you had half of a golf ball. Oh, on the yeah, top of your head absolutely. Broke through. Yeah. And that was, then they couldn't understand while I didn't have pain. I didn't have pain till about till when it started to break through. Of course, I went to see a, a doctor in Manhattan. I have a doc, his name is Nevin Mehta. He's an Indian guy, a brilliant guy. He's a professor. He was the guy that, you know, uh, came up with the conclusion that I had a fungus. I was pretty sure what, where it was, you know. And then I went to see, he sent me to see a surgeon named Dr. Shen. They thought I had a brain cancer, though. But... <clears throat> The spores, I mean, they're, they're nothing to fool around with. They're absolutely nothing to fool around with. I, so. We were recording uh, some audio recordings for a website I used to have called Your Guide to Detox. Uh, like probably, I don't know, was it 2006 or seven? And this is before you had mold remediation done in the house. And we would work there for like maybe, I don't know, six hours, eight hours. And I used to get headaches when I would yeah, come I to know. visit you. Like they, and I, and I didn't know what it was. I just thought, oh, well, I'm maybe I'm staring at my No, head. it's okay. I did, but I would like be like, oh, maybe we're looking You're at a computer. You're lucky you didn't hang around there. I mean, you would have been in trouble. Fred, I've moved. Um, I've moved. I've had mold in four of my apartments that I've. The last four apartments that I've lived in have had water damage and mold. One was so bad, I basically had to move in like three days. Yeah, don't fool around with it. But yeah. don't forget, I was in there for years. Yeah. When Rory and I went to Australia. I definitely went to Australia with double pneumonia. No yeah. two ways about it. Then when I got to Australia, the guy out there wanted to test me, you know, see how, what kind of a runner I was. He said, I want to go for a run. Me, I had double pneumonia. So I didn't want to say no. So I went out and ran five miles fast with double pneumonia. So you got to give something credit to a raw food diet. You know, I think Robin's trying to come in. Hold on, let me let Okay, her. all right, go ahead. No, I thought Robin was trying to come in because I heard some keys. Um, so wait, you ran five miles? Oh, ex Rory. Rory was there. He'll tell you. Yes, five miles. The guy, a lot of, listen, I was, I was close to 80 years old then. I was in my late 70s. Everybody, you know, people want to see how much validity to, to what you're doing. And then when I was sick with the mold, I mean, people thought I died. And a lot of people were trying to find me and check up on me. I mean, I don't think they really were concerned about me. Some of them really didn't know me. They were just wanting to find out if I survived because I think, uh, you know, I'll put it this way. If I die in a plane crash, and, uh, you know, when I'm 90, 100 years old, I'll be 90 soon, 100 years old, they're going to blame it on the diet. Let's you, face they're it. They're going to say you should have had chicken. Yeah, I should have had say. chicken. <laughs> well, when I had the mold, they tried to convince me to eat animal protein. I said, no, it's no way. It's so not going to happen. They were trying to find out what was going on with, uh, with your chest and your lungs, and they thought you had aspirational pneumonia, so they were trying right. to do a test. This is back to the dry fast now that it was done in the hospital. Yeah. Um, so what? They, were, they put you in for observation. They didn't want you to have any liquid. Yeah, they told me that they were in order to, I couldn't eat or I couldn't drink anything for the... Uh, in order to have the test they were going to give me. You know, they were going to watch, let me swap, let me eat something and watch me. Oh, gee. Watch <laughs> it's me. okay. Let me turn this off. Yeah. That, Mike, that was fascinating, the way that happened. So, and there was no IV, nothing? No, no. Nothing. They couldn't, they couldn't give me an IV because they, were ga they gave me an IV, 
Maybe in the back of they arm. couldn't give me an IV because my legs were like balloons from the salt. Uh -huh. So they couldn't give it to me. So they said that you're going to have to wait. You can't eat and you can't drink. So I thought about it. I said, maybe this is an opportunity for me. So I didn't say nothing. Somehow I got lost in the shuffle. Marcus knows about it. I got yeah. lost in the shuffle. Yeah, Alma, your wife told me about oh, this yeah, too. Alma, she watched of course. the whole thing happen. Robin was fighting with the doctor. So what happens is that um, it, it was amazing. It went seven days. My tongue felt like it was a shoe in my mouth, oh, like I had a shoe in my mouth. So after the seventh day, I told him, listen, you better either give me that test for aspirational pneumonia. I said, I'm going to get up here and walk out. I couldn't walk. I mean, I, they had to roll me over in bed. I was on the brink of eternity. I really was. And they still hadn't realized. That, no, that they, they, didn't, they never realized it. That's a fact. And what happened when they did realize that you were on that? They didn't realize it. They took me down and gave me the test. And then they started letting me drink water. Uh -huh, they uh -huh. never realized it. There, there was a couple of male nurses that I know of were friends with them, you know. And one guy told me, Freddie, we got a pool. Whether you're going to survive this or not, whether you're going to make it or not. <laughs> so yeah, That must have been the best water you ever tasted in your life. <laughs> you have no idea. No idea. My wife was rubbing a, uh, a stick. You know, they had these sticks that she used to put, put a little water on my mouth, you know. Mike, that was, a, that was a very embarrassing time in my life because I've always been an independent type of guy and never really accepted much help from people. And for me to be laying in that bed, I mean, looking like I was a gone goose and people having to roll me over to bathe me, I couldn't move. It, it was pretty, you know, it was a humbling experience. It taught me a lot about humility, I got to mm -hmm. tell you the truth. Well, how old are you now? Uh, um, I'm 80 yet. I'll be 90 in a year and a half. Amazing. Well, cool. they said I wasn't going to completely. Susan Summers wrote an article about severe mold poisoning in one of her books. Her husband had it. I spoke to that doctor. He said, you're never going to recover completely. You're always going to have spores in your system. So <clears throat> I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think they're there anymore, but I'm very cautious. I, I did certain feelings that I look for, and uh, right now... Um, I mean, I did have some damage done to me by what took place in the hospital. I remember. I remember I was sitting in the hospital uh, one night, and it was like 1 a.m., and uh, I came up to see you after I closed the office, and they wanted to give you an IV, and they put something in you, and you were trying to, you were telling them, you were like, I'm having a reaction to this. And they're like, no, 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 that's normal, that's normal. And you were really trying to be a good sport about it, and you were like, but you knew. Well, I and was going to. Yeah. You could see on your arm, it suddenly starts to get inflamed. The arm starts to swell. You get, it's getting hot. And you're like, and then they, then they finally said, like, oh, yeah, you're having a reaction to that. Yeah. They, Mike, they, listen, they almost, I almost died a couple of times. Mm -hmm. If I wasn't the type of person I am, it's, it's mentally tough and healthy, I would have I died. There's no two ways about it. Plus, when I went home, one doctor, there was a, he comes, can I talk to you? I said, yeah, he said, I want to come. I want to come and talk to you late tonight. I said, okay, come whenever you want. He actually came 4 o'clock in the morning. He said, Mr. Bishop, if you were my father, I would go home. I said, I'm going home. So the ammonia was stabilized. I went home. I went home. I stopped everything. But um, my vitamin B12, my testosterone was down to almost nothing. I mean, it was amazing what happened to me. As a result of this whole thing uh, yeah. or the result Before of the that, dry fest? It was, everything was good. So what happened, I didn't realize I had a tingling sensation in my extremities. And I thought it was from, you know, from the medication they gave me. Not because my vitamin B12 was always good. I always had B12 was always above 400, even without the supplements for the first 35 years, the first 30 years. So what happened, I said, wait, but something's wrong here. This, this is not right. So I went to see a doctor friend of mine. I said, I want you to check my testosterone, my vitamin B12. My, my vitamin B12, I mean, it was almost non-existent. It was down to 20. The normal range is 200 to like 950, 911. So I think I have some, some damage from that mm -hmm. because that lasted a long time. So it couldn't affect you neurologically. And I think I, I do have some effects that other people might not recognize, but I, I think they're, they're there. Once you have, once neuron cells are dead and damaged, it's pretty, I came back a long way. I mean, I could still run and do everything like that, 
But if I try to move real quickly, and you know, my balance goes off a little bit, and I, that's what it's from. And, um, but I came back from everything. It took me, when I first came home, um, I wanted to try to walk. I, need, I needed an assistant to walk, and a physical therapist come in, and my wife tells him, my, my husband thinks he could walk. And the guy says, what makes you think you could walk? I said, well, if you help me, I can walk. I said, I want to stop moving as soon as I possibly can. So he was a real nice guy. He said, okay, I'll take you out in the street and let's see if you can walk. So he held my arm and I walked down the street and there was a hill to the left that was Holly Street. And I said, let me go up the hill. He said, no, no, I wouldn't go up the hill today. Because I was a, I was a toothpick. Mm -hmm. And you know, I just looked terrible. You wouldn't have recognized me. So he came back a day and a half the next day and he said, let, I said, let's go. And we went out, we walked. He let me walk up the hill and he kept coming back. Well, within a week and a half, I was walking unassisted. And then he says, gee, you don't need me anymore. You don't have to keep coming. I don't have to keep coming in there. Well, within about six weeks, I was walking up all on big hills. Mm -hmm. But I still had all these crazy symptoms and feelings and everything. And now you're back to running? Yep. Yeah, so you, you made a huge recovery. I mean, you look better than you did before you got sick from the mold. Well, thank you. You look you. amazing. I appreciate that. But... Uh, let me, uh, let me bring us back to the dry fest. Do you think that seven days was beneficial to you? Well, listen, I'm not encouraging anybody. I, I'm very careful what I say about fasting because I don't, I'm careful to tell people about my experience, my long-term experience with water fasting and dry fasting because I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm actually scared people trying these things without knowing what the, how bad they could feel. Yeah. So, well, people are doing a lot of these things. Um, well, I think I think that I really because at that point is when my con my condition starts to turn around. Because up until that point, I wasn't getting better with the antibiotics they were giving. Me. In fact, it was really I think they were hurting me more than they were helping me. I have no doubt that the hospital really helped, that helped me in one respect, but in the other respects, uh, I would be dishonest to say that you know it took me a long time to recover from what was done in the hospital. Because once I, you know, I knew, I knew it was the mold and I was treating myself accordingly by getting into a hyperbaric chamber, by using um, the EPF, by taking mega doses of, uh, of the uh, probit, the uh, probiotics, which is a borderline miraculous. And then, of course, sticking 100% to my raw food diet, like clockwork, not eating late at night, trying to sleep as much as I can. Unfortunately for me, I have flaws. I'm not a great sleeper. I'm the type of guy I can go to bed and wake up at two o'clock in the morning and that's it. But usually, most of the time, I feel refreshed. Like we were just on the road. We only slept three hours a night. We, we, we were p pushed right through there. Well, the cleaner you eat, the less recovery you need. Exactly. Yeah. Well, less work for your body to do to go through this. It's a self-dialysis process. When you're sleeping at night, you go into REM sleep, you're actually on dialysis. That's why you're eating late at night, you're eating heavy foods. Of course you can survive it. But once you start to eat this well, I just had a guy tell me the other day, guy's a lawyer, he's eating good for like three weeks. His ejection factor went up. He showed so much improvement. He said he went out and he ate the veal cut with Parmesan. He said, I thought I got shot. He said, I had to go home and lay down. He said, he felt okay the next day. He said, I'm not doing that again. You, you just, and he's only been doing this a short time. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I want to keep bringing us back because I'm curious. I understand the benefit of juice fasting. Done plenty of that. Understand the benefit of water fasting. Done a bit of that myself, and I've learned a lot from you and um, from other people I know that are either clients or friends that have engaged in that. And not, we're not trying to give anybody any advice, right. but I'm trying to understand what's the value then in removing water, it being a solvent and a transport medium and hydrating. I always thought that was the, the one foundational element to it a is. fast to assist in the body. But what you're doing over a short period of time, you're raising your core temperature. You're kind of burning things off. And Almost you, like a fever state. You're right, you're, you're, right. You hit the nail right on the head. It's, mm -hmm. like, it's like a fever. So that's the goal with, with dry right. fasting. And but uh, uh, I think Sergey said that somebody had did it 18 days. I definitely would not try that because after seven days, the way my mouth felt, I mean, my mouth felt pretty terrible. It's, I can't imagine that's even possible that someone could survive 18 days without water. I, 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 I asked somebody that was a knowledgeable person that's really 
was kind of enchanted by eating animal protein. I says, what do you think is the most important nutrient that the body, taking into consideration everything, mm -hmm. not just food. So he thought, he said animal protein. That's not true. Number one is oxygen. Of course. Number two is water. Mm -hmm. Number three is cal calories. If, you, if, you're, if you're not getting enough calories, which I found out when I became a raw food, I was trained to run a marathon, I wasn't getting enough calories, and I could train, but when it, by the end of the week, I, I couldn't run. That's when I started to incorporate more fruit into my diet. Because mm -hmm. people are saying, don't eat fruit, it's no good for you. Even years ago, that's nothing new. You got, either got to be getting your energy from either starches or sugars. But your brain can only burn glucose as fuel. And now the latest science, and there's still people telling people that you know, you shouldn't eat fruit because of the sugar, especially because of, you know, if you have cancer, because of what, what Otto Warburg said. Otto Warburg was not talking about that type of fermentation. He was really talking about indigestion. You could have loaded, of, you could be loaded with fermentation and be eating hot dogs and hamburgers a day and haven't eaten an apple in 30 years. People, that's where people are making a tremendous mistake. So let's, let's talk about that because there is, we're, we're talking about fruit. We're talking about how much we love jackfruit. That's how like we started the conversation. Uh, but um, there is an inherent problem and we've seen it with people that lived on fruitarian diets long term. They die. Yeah, and, wh and what are they dying of from that? What is the result of that diet? Demineralization, fermentation? Yeah, demineralization, fermentation. Um, and the fermentation is fruit sugars fermenting in their intestines and in their blood. Well, the reason for that, normally, <clears throat> the fruit is higher in, uh, higher in vitamins and lower in minerals. You can get enough minerals, but um, the whole problem is when you, when I, when I eat fruit, I don't eat a lot of fruit. I might have two mangoes. That's it. But if I want to have, if I need more calories and I'm exercising a lot, I'll wait a couple of hours and not eat another couple of pieces of fruit. Or you could always stabilize the, front, the, the uh, blood sugar by eating a little bit of celery, a little bit of lettuce, because that'll stabilize the blood sugar. Mm -hmm. You know, if you eat too much uh, fruit and you're not running, uh, you know, 70, 40, 50, 60, 70 miles a week to burn those calories, I mean, it's just too much sugar. Your blood sugar is going to go up and down. And when it goes up and down, it starts a vicious cycle where you're going to be eating more and more and more fruit. You'll get into the point where, you know, that's where people run into trouble. So you have to stay ahead of the fruit you're eating. So if you're exceptionally athletic, you're going to be able to burn those sugars yeah, I, and I you did, won't have I a problem. It. You know, you, you know who Durian Ryder is, right? You must have heard yeah, of I him. Yeah, I know who he is. Yeah, so he basically started off in this very purest fruitarian thing. Then he sort of derailed and he got into eating cooked vegan food and lots of like pasta Protect and starches. rice. But now he's derailed and he's gone into like s Sprite and, you know, like sodas and, and all this kind of stuff and cooked vegan food. But I've watched what he does now. He'll take a bunch of watermelon and blend it. And you know what that's like. It's super sweet. You blend up watermelon. Yeah. super sweet. But he pours white sugar into it now. Now he's super fit. He's super lean. He just like cycles all the time and works out and does that kind of stuff. But uh, what's the inherent problem with that then? It's like, so I want people to understand what's happening. With it's people. crazy. That's the inherent problem well, with it. Yeah, Listen, that's imbalanced. I remember... I did, one time, um, he doesn't know me from a hole in the wall. He never met me. Oh, uh, right. I know where you're going with this. Okay, so right. I was talking to Matt Monica about fermentation. You know what I mean? So he, uh, well, listen, I don't, know the guy. I don't know the guy. He might be a nice guy for all I know. I know he starts negative, uh, you know, creates situations where people, he draws people to his, to his podcast and everything like that. And I remember... Tell him, Rory, I said, that kid's going to get himself in trouble. He's not going to stay on this type of a diet. He can exercise all he wants. He can exercise till he's blue in the face. But he's on a downhill, downhill road to trouble. Well, he, then, he made a video that was a parody where he was pretending to be Matt Monarch right. talking on the phone to you. And uh, he was making fun of colonics and eating too much fruit because right. that, yeah. So the issue. So now do, he's eating, he's drinking soda and everything? Oh, for... What he's eating right now is so out like his his so his his parameter is veganism, super about being vegan, right. really into fitness cycling and body movement. But the foods that he's eating, it's basically um, carbohydrates and sugar a at any level, at any 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 ver vegan version of this is fine. It right. could be white sugar, it could be dumplings, well, it could I be wish anything. Well, I well, but uh, yeah. I know plenty of people have done that. That's not new. 
Actually, junk food, if you're exercising real hard, like I understand he, he runs and rides all day. He does, yeah. He better keep it up. Because uh, what happens with people like that? I know a guy died, that definitely died from that. He was one of the best runners I ever met. He used to come to a race and eat about 24 sugar-coated donuts and drink a couple of Coca-Colas and run 15 miles to go home, and he was unbeatable. But he started to fall apart. Junk food is, the, is a quick source of energy. The only thing is a high-octane fuel in a, a, an engine that should be burning regular gas. So it's so, like it's like taking those gels, like when runners are doing uh, ultra uh, marathons and stuff, and they start shooting the the glucose. No, this is 100 percent worse. Well, yeah, because of, yeah. Right. Yeah. So what happens is, I mean, it's a form of a, it's an addiction. Hmm. So he's got a problem going. I didn't know he was slipped down into that, but all slipped the people far. that he made food fun of before, I mean. I hope he remembers some of the things that he said, you know, with all due respect about people, you know. So I wish him well. I hope, I, he, hope he comes out of this okay. How old is he now? I, 50, I think, 60? No, no. Durian Ryder's got to be, um, if he's not my age, he's got to be in his late 30s or early 40s. I think we're probably around the same age. He's probably uh, like 42. I don't know, though, uh, how old Durian Ryder is. God bless um, him. Yeah, I mean, I love this. I love his vegan message. People love to watch him because of the drama, the big breakup that happened well, with him and his, his girlfriend at the time and all that. Um, but he, he wasn't very good at uh, creating community and relationships, I think, and, you know, uh, when it came to the YouTube community around food and nutrition. So just to drive it home, when somebody eats too much fruit or eats a diet specifically of fruit and they're taking in more sugars than they need, that sugar can ferment in the intestines and the blood. It's going to cause bloat. Yeah, that's it's right. Cause blow. And then it's going to cause well, acidity. Well, your blood sugar's bouncing up and down. It's going to cause... If it, once you start to ferment... It's, see, the real problem is, is that when you do that, you fall into that trap, which he's probably into. Even if you exercise real hard, uh, you better be passing a lot of gas and burping a lot because otherwise, once you start to ferment... Instead of creating an alkaline, you know, between 7.35 and 7.45, you're creating that fermentation is very, very acid forming. Yeah. And it can lead to a lot of different So it's problems. the byproducts of the, of the sugar fermentation from different, right. yeah. Well, and uh, creates acidity, demineralization, creates pressure on the tissue. Well, when you're so fermenting, you're losing minerals like crazy because your body, you're pulling minerals. You're not, you can't get it from your diet, which fruit is not overloaded with minerals. You're going to pull it out of your skeletal frame. I've seen plenty of old time. Raw food guys end up all distorted, all crooked up because they, you know, your, your skeletal frame is like a bank for, for, for uh, calcium and minerals. It'll pull it right out of your bones. Mm -hmm. So your blood will look good. You'll say, gee, I got enough in my blood. Yeah, but you're taking it out of your bones. Right. Yeah, so your body's always in a state of adjusting that acidity and right. you're, you're losing out of the well, bank account. You're, you're always trying to juggle to save your life. So that's and that's a pure fruitarian diet, or that's somebody that uh, has a that's toxic, has a sluggish intestine, that's loaded with yeast. They're eating too much fruit sugar, and it's fermenting, creating that environment. Well, for people listening, what is a good uh, goal for fruit consumption? Because a lot of people into the vegan movement, raw vegan movement, are really into fruit. I mean, I am. I eat a lot of fruit I, I and juices too. all day. So I where, like so, fruit. So where's the line? Where should people draw the line where they go? You know what? I'm eating way too much fruit. Where's the line with that? Listen, fruit is delicious. It's delicious. Let's yeah. face it. To me, it's absolutely, you know, it's a pleasure to eat fruit. The more you eat, if you're overeating and your exercise level doesn't mean you, doesn't um, use the amount of sugar that you're eating, your blood sugar could bounce up and down. And the whole problem is no matter what you eat, and gluttony doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Whatever your body can utilize, it has to... If it can, get rid of the rest. So when you're eating a tremendous amount of fruit, what happens with a lot of people, they just can, they eat fruit throughout the whole day. They start eating fruit. They'll, they'll eat like five or six pieces of fruit. They'll get a buzz for about, you know, about five minutes after they do it. Then all of a sudden, it's gonna they're going to crash. People tell them to eat more fruit when that happens. So it goes back up again. So you spend the whole day, day eating fruit. If, I, if I'm eating some fruit... I'll, I'll eat a piece of celery or a leaf, or if I ate a lot, unless I just exercise real hard. When you exercise real hard, say if you went for a run or you were doing push-ups and jumping jacks or burpees, whatever people do, and then if you do that, uh, for about half hour to 45 minutes after you do that, your body's not going to secrete insulin. So you can eat a tremendous amount of 
of uh, sugar. Your, na- your body does that so you can restore your blood sugar. Mm-hmm. So if you do that, your blood sugar, it's going to suck up all that sugar, and you're going to feel wonderful. You won't go too high. You won't get too low. I've seen a lot of people try to go to basically a mostly fruit diet. In the first two or three years, they feel wonderful. But after that, they start to have trouble, make three, four, five years. I seen guys really get in trouble years ago because there was a few, there was a dilemma going on in natural hygiene about whether you should be eating starches or whether you should be eating fruit. And that's still, that dilemma still exists. Fred, I'm putting this camera on you only because <laughs> I, think, uh, I think that camera shut off and I don't have Nick here to help me. So I just threw this one up so I could catch the last words that you were saying. Um, but, uh, you know, it's almost 8 o'clock at night. My cameras are shutting off. That's okay. I think we, uh, I think we'll you do created, it again. I think you created a lot of value here. I appreciate it very much. I'll come back anytime you want. Yeah, I appreciate that, Fred. Thank you for doing this with me. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. These are it really great. It was fun. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Very kind of you. Guys, I hope you enjoyed that. I know the ending got a little bit twisty there at the end. Dr. Bishy had some people waiting for him, and uh, then one of the cameras shut off, so we just did our best. And uh, I was happy to just capture the moment because he happened to be at the office at Vitality at a time when we were closed, and uh, it was just a good opportunity to sit down, catch up with him. Fascinating man. Uh, I've known him for almost 25 years now. And uh, anyway, anytime I get with him, I always want to capture it in a podcast so other people can benefit from uh, his knowledge and experience. So wasn't a big fan of the GoPros, uh, especially in the low light that we have there at Vitality. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you're probably like, hey, wait a second. Mike started this podcast in Vitality. The podcast happened at Vitality. And now it looks like he's sitting in Ashland, Oregon in his uh, office back there. That is correct because I'm filming the outro to this podcast in Oregon. So um, next podcast, my friend Dennis Kahlo comes back. We go all over the place. One of my favorite podcasts. We had such a great time. We talked about so many different things. Uh, also wasn't a big fan of the GoPros when we set those up. And uh, But anyway, we're going to figure it out. We're going to find out what cameras we're going to use. So anyway, um, thank you, thank you, thank you for watching and listening to this podcast. If you hear snoring, that's my puppy in the background snoring on the floor next to me. Um, and uh, I will see you guys next time.